And you are you're at the factory in Taiwan. Yeah, I'm. Uh, you know, it's it's obviously Saturday here, but I came into the company to so everybody could maybe have a look and see uh, what what's going on here. This is my mate John Ebsen. Yeah. Uh, Hi, John. A few times KOM winner. We're having a few drinks here. Uh, nice. This is our little R and D offices. Again, nobody is quite here today, but uh, yeah, it's a nice little working place here. Uh, this is uh, another mate, Stanley. He's in charge of testing. And this is our quality uh, sort of quality control area over here. And uh, this is our, our door of fame here. We got Baden Cook, Greg LeMond, Jan Bacalan, David Miller, Feng Chen Kai. Just, you know, we're waiting on you, Alex, to come visit Taiwan. <laughs> yeah. yeah, hopefully one day. Yeah, and this is our, uh, our little testing area here. So this is where we, uh, we do a lot of our uh, quality testing. So some of our machines here for impact. This is our uh, stiffness tester. So this is uh, some frames that were left over from earlier in the week where they're doing a little bit of a sort of a benchmarking to understand how stiff the frames are. And uh, this is uh, factor one over here that's being uh, fatigue tested for the head tube. So this takes a couple of days to finish. So even it's Saturday, this will keep running. And then uh, this kind of gives you an idea of some of the things that we benchmark over time. We always have other customers' frames. And then if it's white, that means it's an R&D. So those are still top secret, but I'll let you guys see them all. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So that's oh, our, nice. uh, our little, little QC lab. and. Yeah, and there's the handlebars on the bench ready to go. Yeah. That's what's happening with them. Um, these are all just product that we do sort of random testing on. So these are black ink handlebars that, you know, they, they were finished over the week. And so they'll uh, do some measurements on it. You always want to make sure that sort of the brake lever areas and things like that are all at the right size. And then they'll actually take some of these and they'll go back into the lab there and they'll do some destructive testing. And, yeah. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty cool. That's, that's a, until they obliterate. Until yeah, they break, pretty yeah. much until they break. Yeah. So, it, you know, to break a handlebar, it could take a couple of days on that same machine that the, the factor one is on right now. Yeah. And uh, here's a pretty cool picture of Roman. Maybe we got to get that updated, get you in yeah. the wind tunnel. So. Yeah. Yeah. Which wind tunnel is that? Uh, that's in Switzerland. Yeah. Uh, oh, cool. Just, yeah. Nice. So I understand you got some questions for me. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I've actually just, um, before we start with questions from everyone, just whilst um, you're doing the, the, the stiffness testing on what looked up like a van. Um, yeah. The, I noticed riding the, uh, the slick in UAE was actually just how remarkably stiff it was. I mean, what I, <laughs> what I personally really like about the two bikes, the van and the, the the one sorry not the, the the slick is tt bike the one yeah is they're both you can you jump on either and you can very much tell they are bikes for um the job that's outlined like in the mm -hmm. in the past i've had the option of climbing bikes and aero bikes and you kind of they kind of seem to do everything reasonably well whereas when i jumped on the one on the one i was like this is by far the stiffest bike I've ever ridden, like noticeably so. Um, and I wondered if that's if there's numbers that come out of that um, out of that test that uh, um, was happening in there that like show the show the stiffness of it. Oh, absolutely. So I mean, that's how you know what we do is you know we we assign the stiffnesses, the goals that we want for the frames, and you know using that that test fixture there, that's how we actually are able to confirm that we, we met those goals, we're also able to, you know, buy other people's frames, test them and understand how they compare against ours. And so, you know, when we developed the one, um, the one wasn't so much focused on weight, it was focused on, you know, absolute arrow and absolute stiffness. And I think that that definitely comes through. Well, you know, the VAM was designed to be stiff enough, but you know, obviously as light as possible. And so, you know, when we're, when we're dealing with the racing teams, it's kind of like, you know, what they say is horses for courses, right? 
And so, you know, and that's how you used the bikes when you were in the UAE, you know, on the days that you were going up to the dam, you probably rode the VAM yeah. and on the, on the flat days you were riding the, uh, the one. Yeah. No, I, and that's something I, I really enjoyed was like you said, horses for courses. You knew it's quite clear, you know, which bike you want to use for what day. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So we'll crack on with the questions from, uh, from various people, including <laughs> some of my teammates. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I mean, let's let's kick off with James Pickley's question. Um, oh, really? He said, what will the next manufacturing innovation be in road bike frames, do you think? Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. I, I think, you know, we, we've kind of reached sort of, in my opinion, we've reached sort of the pinnacle of, of arrow and the pinnacle of weight. And so I think now it kind of comes down to integration, um, the way you know, getting more of like the electronics integrated into the bikes or the way, understanding the way the wheels will react with the bikes or things of that nature. So it, it becomes more of a complete package. Um, but I don't think, you know, there's a lot of gains left to be made in aero or weight, especially when, you know, we, we have the UCI rules that we have to deal with. You know, if the UCI loosens things up, you know, and we can start to, you know, change tube shapes or take things away, then there's still some, some room. But, uh, under the current parameters, there's really not a lot left to do, but I think that it, it really kind of comes down to, to future integration. Yeah, so a bit, I mean, I guess it's like, if you compare it to the car industry, you don't, you generally don't buy a, a car and then buy the wheels and then buy the steering <laughs> wheel and, and then you buy it as a complete, as a exactly. complete package, like we're heading that mm -hmm. way in the bike industry as well. Right, yeah, um, a lot more proprietary parts. It, it becomes a little more troublesome um, I think, um, as we develop more and more proprietary parts for bikes, but I definitely think that's the, you know, the future direction of most bike companies. Yeah. Do you think the, um, on, this is, this is a me question again, um, the ceramic speed drivetrain, is that, uh -huh. do you think that's an interesting, uh, uh, direction? Incredibly cool. However, if you look at the efficiency of a chain, a chain is already like 99.7% efficient. And so they've gotten another 0.2% at 99.9. .9. And so it seems yeah. like an awful lot of work for 0.2% of, you know, of efficiency, you know, and I'm very close with ceramic speed. So I hope they didn't hear me say that, yeah. but I think that's the <laughs> truth beyond it. Yeah. But I think there's some interesting things about, you know, perhaps by going to that system, you could go to a much more narrow wheel, real wheel or something like that, which then could have like arrow gains. But as yeah. far as, you know, going to a cam, you know, it's essentially a camshaft versus a chain there's really not a lot you know it, it there's obviously it's better but it's not that much better so. yeah some differences oh interesting um uh what so a question from scott huk um is interested to know what you think the biggest limitation in carbon manufacture is that needs solving oh gosh i, I think the biggest limitation is it's all still made by hand and it's all still, you know, very much a labor intensive project product. And so it's really, you know, nobody yet has figured out how to automate it. There are, you know, other industries making, you know, basically plastic parts that use carbon fiber, but they're not super light weight bicycle frames. So we haven't yet figured out how to automate it. So because of that, there always, you know, there's always that human factor in it. So it means that you have to have a certain bit of redundancy in the product to make sure that it's absolutely safe. Um, because you, you know, one human is different from the next human and, you know, it's, it's a matter of just a couple millimeters different can totally affect the product, um, the way that it's built. And so you, we still need to account for that. And so I don't really think that's going to change anytime soon. So I, I think that that's our biggest limitation at the moment. And, uh, you know, the kind of materials we use, you know, they're essentially, um, uh, you know, they're used in airplanes, they're used in Formula One, they're used in sporting goods. Um, probably what bicycles are doing right now is already at sort of like the, the highest level of, of development of those industries as far as having the least amount of redundancy in the product. Right. Yeah. Um. Oh, so the next question, I guess, going off of uh, from S.A. Conway, going off of what we saw earlier with the testing, he's just, he just simply asked how durable your frames are, which I guess you know, mm -hmm. uh, what would be more interesting off, off the back of that is 
you know, the, the, the testing that goes on and, and yeah, if you could sort of. Well, I would say, I would say, you know, right now there's an industry standard, it's called the ISO standard and it's actually quite good. And what we try to do is, you know, from our lightest weight, you know, the O2 VAM to our more heavyweight, you know, one, they still need to pass exactly the same test. And we test to 125% as a minimum of the ISO standard. So we're going 25% above uh, what is called out. And so, you know, for the one, that's a pretty easy task. For the O2 VAM, you know, a 700 gram frame, it's obviously a lot harder for that frame to get past 125%. But we want all of our products to, to be able to achieve that, that minimum goal. And so, you know, he asked about what is the durability? None of, the, none of our bicycles would ever break from a standard riding condition. But obviously a 700 gram, you know, O2 VAM, uh, you know, in a crash scenario, it, when there's multiple pileup, that's when we might see, you know, that the frame is a little more fragile than a one, because obviously it's a lot thinner or even just our standard O2. But as, you know, durability wise, you know, if you don't crash and you don't have a bunch of bodies landing on top of you, the, the bikes are, will run essentially forever. Awesome. Um, a question has just come through on the chat. How do you deal with uh, misalignment discrepancies with bottom bracket drilling, the, the drying process of carbon, and to be sure you don't get problems like a creaky bottom bracket? Well, we use, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, we still believe in the press fit bottom bracket. Um, the press fit bottom bracket um, gets some negative uh, um, feedback from some other brands because it is a very highly tolerant part. And so rather than going to a threaded bottom bracket, we still believe very much in a press fit carbon bottom bracket. Our bottom bracket is not drilled. Um, our bottom bracket is actually molded to, to the specification and it's one continuous piece. So there, there is no concern about alignment because you know, we're not coming and drilling you know, from both sides like this it is yeah. made together in the mold as one continuous piece. And so, you know, it is uh, directly aligned with the frame and left to right, they're exactly the same. And, you know, we, we do a very good job holding the tolerance. Unfortunately, some other brands um, less so. And so then it gives a little bit of a, you know, a black, black, you know, black eye to the press fit bottom bracket, but we really don't suffer that problem like some other brands do. A lot of times some brands go to a threaded in bottom bracket. In fact, you know, threaded in is actually cheaper to make than what we're doing. A lot of people think, oh, the press fit is cheaper. And in fact, it's not. The threaded one is actually less huh. expensive. Huh. That, that, answers, uh, that answers one question that I have coming up about um, will factor ever move to a threaded bottom bracket? <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> don't plan. Don't, don't no. have any need to. Don't really have any need yeah. to. Um, question from uh, Map MX: Why not use boron boron through the entire frame? Uh, and also your thoughts on the use of graphene, which has sort of come and gone in the last few years, hasn't it? Well, I think that you know we saw. Well, first answer the question about boron. Boron is a very good material when you have a super super thin laminate structure, but as soon as you add anything over like one millimeter of thickness the boron really isn't able to add that much benefit because the boron is actually not, you know, doing anything other than pre preventing the tube from buckling. So having more like that, what we call the oil can effect, or like if you have a Coca-Cola can where you can kind of squeeze it together, that's what the boron is preventing. And so we use it in super thin tubes, but if we put it all over the bike, um, it really wouldn't have the same benefits. And of course, if you made a whole bike out of it, it wouldn't be a very good bike at all because it's it doesn't have the right properties for it as far as graphene you know i think we all remember nano from 10 15 years ago everything was nano 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 and now we never talk about nano anymore when nano nano was going to be the big revolutionary thing in the bicycle industry or all you know the whole world in fact maybe not just bicycles and now we never hear about it graphene is now the latest you know wonder wonder material you know, it does exist, um, but it hasn't really been commercialized yet. And the problem of it is the amount of money you would have to spend using graphene to actually like achieve 
a difference would be, you know, it'd be monumental. It'd be in the thousands of dollars just in the graphene material um, to achieve a difference. So some companies are, they're, sprink they're sprinkling a little dust of graphene into their glue and they mix it with their carbon fiber and they're like, look, graphene. But, it, you know, it really, it's not providing any benefits. Right. Uh, so it's interesting as James Pickley just chimed in on the, on the live chat asking if uh, nano nanotubes will make it into cycling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they've come and gone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a question from Matt Scott. Um, the Factor 02 is an incredible bike to ride. Uh, how big a part did the carbon layout play in the bike's unique feel and rider experience? Um, well, I, I, think, I think there's several things that play into what makes a bike feel as it does. I think the first one is actually geometry. And I think the geometry, we've been working very hard on it. Um, originally, that geometry was defined by, you know, one of our engineers, Anigo Gisbert. He spent a lot of time working on that. And so the geometry is very important. And then, of course, you know, what you get from the, the laminate material is you get that very lively feeling if you do it right. And so it's kind of a combination of those two things. So a really proper geometry, proper setup. And then, you know, a really lively laminate feeling. And the way to get the very lively laminate feeling is we use, you know, quite a few different materials mixed together. We're not just using one single material. So you can imagine, you know, some bicycle companies, they use one single material. And so that's almost like having, you know, what we call plain gauge of, you know, of uh, feeling. And so it, it doesn't really have that liveliness to it that you get when you start mixing materials and, uh, and then a, Again, going back to geometry, geometry is very important. And a lot of people still, um, in, my, in our opinion, are still kind of going in the wrong direction on that. No, I'd agree with that. Um, so question, well, someone sent a question with me. The username is a bunch of numbers and letters. Um, <laughs> you've, so you've in introduced the Vista, uh, yeah. which is an endurance positioned bike. Is there any plan for more gravel orientated uh, oriented geometry or uh, for more heavy? I, I don't know. My, I'm just reading this question out. I don't know a great deal about sure. the gravel scene, uh, like a DK 200 with an ex, ex, with extra clearance and he put slash 650, which I guess is a wheel size, more in line yeah. with gravel requirements, but with the factor DNA. Sure. Um... I would say, you know, right now um, at Factor, we sponsor a team in North America. Um, it's the Pan Eraser Factor team, very successful gravel racing team. Uh, three guys in the top 20 at Dirty Kanza last year riding um, that bike. But of course, you know, those guys on their wish list is to have a bike that had a little bit bigger tire clearance. And so to answer the question, uh, in the next couple of weeks, we're actually launching uh, a new gravel bike. It's called the LS. Um, this was, um, I, I mention it now because we were actually outed on the internet a couple of days ago because, oh. you know, you can find us, you know, we, we always ride the bikes for several months before we actually start selling them. And so somebody got, you know, wind that we are already riding it. And so yeah. I'll go ahead and I'll announce it now that we'll be launching that bike in a couple of weeks. Oh, that's big news. Big news. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I guess, yeah, the question just come in on the live chat, an interesting one. Um, I'm going to take that question and ask for all the frames. How many hours does it take to make? Uh, this person's asked for an O2 frame, but I guess the next follow-up question to that is, does it differentiate between the, between the frames? Um, it does a little bit. I mean, you have to look at, so an O2 has about 300 pieces of carbon, while an O2 BAM probably has about 340, 350 pieces of carbon. So it's a little bit different, but for the most part, it takes about, if we, you know, if we're only talking about the, the time that it takes to actually put the carbon down on the preform, it's about four or five hours. If we look at the time that it takes for a frame to run through the factory, so that means like the cutting a material all the way through to the painting process takes about 55 hours. And just in the carbon time, it takes about 24 hours. Um, it's big. Um, will there be an O2 van without cables? <laughs> wow, it's hard to uh, hard to dodge some of these questions. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what I can say is, when we started the the O2 VAM, 
the goal was to have the world's lightest disc brake frame. And what we can see is obviously many companies can produce bikes that have hidden cables. So, and if we look at them, obviously, Factor, very strong engineering company, had that been one of our goals, we could have achieved that. But our goal was the world's lightest disc brake frame. And in order to have the world's lightest disc brake frame, um, we chose to still um, have mechanical shifting, which is important um, because some people want to go that one step further, um, as well as have rim brake. And when you add those two things in there, it's not possible to have those fully hidden cables. The other thing is we look at most of those bikes on the market now that have the fully hidden cables, it's at least a hundred gram weight penalty for just the, the upper bearing, the special stems, many things, you know, required in order to have those hidden cables. So, you know, there's a, there's a famous saying, and it didn't come from me, it came from one of the founders of Cervelo. And what he said is, you know, just because you hide something from the wind doesn't make it aerodynamic. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I kind of really take that to heart. So I'll be honest, though, we are looking at, you know, if we go DI2 only, if we don't offer rim brakes, could we do that? Yeah, we could do that fairly easily. Will we do it? Mm, probably. Uh, when? It's still not decided yet. Yeah. Do you think, a question from me, do you think the, um, the market or the industry is going towards a full disc brake um, like everyone's going to be on disc brakes or do you think there'll be some people hanging on to rim brakes for? I think life? when we look at the, when we look at the aero bikes, they're fully disc brake. When we look at something like the O2 VAM, there are still people that want to build the, you know, a sub six kilo bike or, you know, at six kilos, things like that. And so those people are still looking for, you know, mechanical rim brake bikes to get to that weight. And so there still is a demand. We see about maybe 20% of our sales are rim brakes still. Um, but I think, you know, just three years ago, it was 100% of our sales. So it's obviously moved to disc brake quite a bit. Yeah. Um, oh, that's an interesting one's just come in. Um, is there really a risk of cracking the top tube if someone sits on the, on the van? <laughs> <laughs> Depends how big they are. Yeah, I've got well, me. It's uh, sort of seventy-seven kilos. I need to. Uh, <laughs> no, sit. seventy-seven kilos is fine. I think you know our concern is not so much someone sitting on on the top tube at, at a stoplight. I think our bigger concern is you know the what we call or Lance Armstrong calls the super tuck, you know, of the guys that are are descending on the top tube. So you have mm -hmm. basically almost all of your weight sitting on the top tube. And then if you do happen to hit a pothole or something like that, it is very thin and it is possible to cause some damage. Um, we, you know, the bike is not designed for that case scenario. The bike is designed to function as a bike, not as a chair. And so um, I also think the super tuck is a bit stupid myself. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that, that's the concern there. But, you know, the average everyday bike rider, you know, pulled up at a stoplight sitting on the top tube, that's, it's quite fine. I do it all the time myself. I'm over 70 kilos, not quite 77 though. But, you know. <laughs> um, so we've, we've had this chat, but I think there's been a few people asking about the split down tube on the slick and the one. Um, uh -huh. And I, I remember when I first was looking at the bikes, just racking my brains as to I, I just assumed it was an aerodynamic um thing i was just racking my brains as to how it worked and couldn't work it out and then we sat down on the bus in in jerusalem and uh you explained it to me so for the benefits of our viewers can you can you explain the split down tube yeah i mean the split down tube it does have a slight aero benefit but it is more about um essentially if, if we look at most time trial bikes or aero road bikes, they have very deep, very thin uh, down tubes. And by going very deep and very thin, they're not very stiff. And so what we've done is with the same surface area as a, as a very deep, um, very deep, very thin uh, airfoil down tube, we've made two separate airfoils that have the same surface area, but because they have, they both have, you know, they're both, fully complete. So it's kind of like having an I-beam running down the center 
of between the two down tubes. So what you end up with is you don't lose any aero efficiency, but you end up with a much stiffer bottom bracket area um, and much stiffer down tube, much better control, um, which is very important for time trial and you know for your standard aero bike. And I think that's what you've already experienced. And so I think a lot of people, they think of it as an aero feature, but in fact, it's a stiffness feature and it's not an aero uh, gain or loss. Yeah, and I, I know I've noticed when I do uh, on the turbo trainer, if I'm doing like real big high torque strength efforts, if you look down at most bikes, you can see the bottom bracket just moving sort of side to side by, uh, I don't know, half a, half a centimetre or a centimetre. But on the, on the slick, it's, it's rock solid. And that's, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you fix the rear wheel, you can really, you can really notice and see it. Um, so a question from Travis Cuthbert, have you ever thought of making or producing a mountain bike uh, under the factor or black ink branding? Um, you know, we, we're a company that rides bikes. So, you know, my sales manager, former professional, uh, Bait and Cook, one of our you know shareholders, we like to ride bikes, and some of us also like to ride mountain bikes. So obviously, it would make sense that you know before long, uh, we would have a mountain bike in our lineup. Um, you know, the goal is not to be a premium racing bike company, but to be a premium bicycle company. And so I think you'll see from Factor, you know, in the coming you know couple of years we will have more offerings and quite possibly it would include a mountain bike. Oh, cool. that's amazing. Well, so, um, another question coming, where do you see factor in five years off the back <laughs> other than a mountain bike? Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, factor actually is five years old now. So, you know, five years from now, I hope that, you know, our ideally I'd like to be the number one premium bicycle supplier uh, in the world. What does that mean? I'm not really sure just yet, but you know, I can see, you know, factor in e-bikes. I can see factor in mountain bikes, and and I can obviously see that we've you know done a fairly decent job so far with the racing bikes that we've produced. Yeah. Um. Talking about racing bikes, how's the transition been coming back into the World Tour from a year or two in Pro Conti? I guess what are the, um, what are the differences between because uh, you you've been with AG2R then with Rompot and now with Israel Startup Nation has there been any sort of marked differences between the three teams? Um, well, obviously, you know when I with AG2R I was very much um, you know we were all very much bike racing fans. Uh, Rompot was about staying active and having guys that were able to continue the product development, test our products, because, you know, they were racing on both black ink wheels as well as um, factor frames when we didn't have the black ink wheels uh, with AG2R. So it was a good opportunity to learn, to continue to learn. But obviously, you know, the results that you achieve um, at that pro Conti level, you know, don't not to take anything away from Lars or come, some of the guys there. Um, is not the same that you achieve, you know, with a world tour team. So it made being a bicycle fan a little less exciting, but it still achieved the goal we needed of our product development. Um, but of course, you know, also from a marketing standpoint, it's completely different, but also from the price, it's also completely different as well. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a matter of, you know, a hundred bikes total and then, you know, call it a day versus the several hundreds of bikes and, you know, large sums of, money that need to be paid yeah. in order to be in the world tour. So. Yeah. Um, are there any more frame uh, question from Max Hayward on the, on the live chat? Are there any more frame colorways planned for the new O2? Um, right now we have the, the two that we've launched, the Miami blue and the, uh, the pearl white, but uh, we are updating our Prisma studio to have about, I think it's about 12 other colors that you can choose from. And so that's sort of our goal is we'd like the offers, you know, the basic colors that we really like. But then if somebody wants pink or blue or yellow or green or orange, they can go on Prisma Studio and pick whatever they want. And about five weeks later, they can have delivery of it. And we're trying to make that even less. <laughs> um, uh, another question from Scott from before. Apart from the more advanced techniques used to make the Factor O2, um, 
and uh, the O2 V2, what sort of benefits apart from weight would an average rider expect to experience? Um, gosh, I'm not sure I understood the question, but I think if the, if it's more about what is the difference between the O2 VAM and the O2, um, you know, it predominantly comes down to obviously the, the O2 is, you know, it's about 25% heavier and, um, ride quality is quite similar. Um, you know, th those are, you know, so it's basically, you know, going to come down to the weight is, is the main differentiator at the moment. Um, I think that, um, the other, you know, m main difference would be, you know, again, the ride feel on the O2 VAM is going to be a lot more lively than what you would experience on the O2. Yeah. Uh, question in from Glenn Bra Blake about the UK, uh, factor base. Why, was there any sure. specific reason for choosing Lotus's, uh, Norfolk base there? Um, yeah, we were almost born in the same place. So, you know, that was where Factor was originally born from at BF1 Systems, uh, was also in Norfolk. And so, you know, as a bit of a return to our roots, I think the other thing is it opens up the opportunity, you know, to, to talk to people like Red Bull, to talk to Lotus, to talk to, you know, a number of, of um, motorsports companies that are all located there. So we are looking, you know, always to to learn from those companies. And so having the, the access to them there, and also a lot of the people from those motorsports companies are very much into bicycles. So it's yeah. nice that they can also come visit us as well. Yeah. A little cross pollination nice. that way. Yeah, I'll, I'll be, um, I will make it over to the, to the base there at some point. It's about an 80 mile ride from my base in the UK. So it's uh, there and then get a lift back, I think. Um, when you started, when you started Factor, I mean, can you talk us through actually how Factor started and, and the sort of the question off the back of that is, was the dream to be in the world tour? Um, I think, you know, going way back, um, you know, I, I ran a very successful manufacturing company um, that manufactured bikes for brands like Cervelo and Canyon. And we worked with Trek and Ziff and Envy and Santa Cruz. It's a pretty long list and it was pretty interesting. Um, but a friend of mine, Baden Cook contacted me and he's like, he's like, what, what if we, you know, started a bicycle brand together, you know? And sort of his idea was, was you know, he, he was really the person who brought that forward. And so, um, I had already been working with um, with Factor um, when it was owned by BF1, producing their first. It was called the Vizvirs, or Vizvirez, sorry. And uh, so it was a pretty cool bike, but it wasn't really, you know, didn't really commercially be a success. And so, you know, I spoke to Baden about why don't we, you know, discuss with them if they'd be interested in selling it, and they were. And of course, one of our goals um, was to be in the world tour. Um, I would say that uh, it happened a little sooner than maybe we expected with AG2R, maybe a little sooner than was prudent um, because you know we were basically sponsoring AG2R before we had any sales channel set up. So even though we had a lot of demand for our bikes, we had no way of really reaching the customers. And so you know it's a very expensive proposition to be sponsoring a team without selling any bikes. But um, I think it's sort of the chicken and the egg because we sponsored AG2R. Obviously then many people wanted to sell our bikes. And so, you know, that's how we're just five years on now. And, you know, we're, you know, had we not done that, we wouldn't near, be in nearly the position we are today. Um, actually, Rob, can you talk us through because uh, you, you were a pro yourself a very good pro yourself um, no not not very good but well, yeah I raced bikes, um, yeah can you can you talk us through actually how you um you went from being a pro cyclist to an entrepreneur and and you know based in Taiwan and and just your your story because it's quite a fascinating one yeah well I, I think I was quite lucky you know I, I was racing bikes um I stopped for many years um, I started race bikes again. That's how I met a lot of, you know, my current friends was through, you know, the second time a uh, career of racing bikes. But, you know, I, I landed in Taiwan in 1996. Um, I raced the Tour of Taiwan. And it was a time when uh, high end hadn't quite reached, uh, you know, Taiwan yet. Things were still made in America. Things were still made in Europe. 
And uh, I was presented with an opportunity to work for a carbon fiber factory in Taiwan. And I thought, no, maybe now is a good opportunity to do something different because, you know, I was planning, you know, to maybe race a bit longer, but then it was, you know, it's like, well, you know, now's a good time. So, you know, I kind of jumped at that chance. And I think, you know, we as people, we're always offered like lots of different opportunities. And a lot of times we don't take them. I'm the kind of person when somebody offers me something, I kind of like, yeah, let me try. You know, I don't, I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about it. And so, you know, I, I jumped at that opportunity and it was just like, just a series of events that, you know, so I worked for that company for a couple of years, that company joined the stock market. I was able to start my own company. Um, you know, uh, very fortuitously, I met Phil and Gerard, the founders of Cervelo, who, um, you know, when it was a tiny company and they decided they wanted to work with me because, you know, they kind of trusted me. And so, you know, as they were growing at, you know, a light speed pace, I had to kind of keep up with them. And so, you know, the first year we made like 75 bikes for Cervelo. And I think the last year we made 44,000, you know, and so, you know, <laughs> we always had to kind of keep up with their growth. And so, you know, we, you know, and Cervelo was one of my customers, obviously wasn't my only one. So, you know, it was, it was, uh, you know, very fortuitous, like I said, that, uh, you know, being at the right place at the right time and, you know, having an understanding of bicycles because very few people here in Taiwan at that time rode bicycles and they really didn't know what it was they were producing. It looked like a bicycle, but it didn't actually ride like a bicycle. And so, you know, having that ability really helped to, uh, to, you know, be successful here. Cool. Um, uh, Vlado Savic has uh, just chimed in. He says, it's not a question because he says, but can you thank Rob and John for making the best bikes out there? That's <laughs> nice. Just a question from Michelle. I mean, I guess we talked about where we wanted to see where you wanted Factor to be in five years, but uh, Michelle's just asked, what's your dream? Simple as that. Three words. What's your what's dream? Your dream? Wow, I didn't know that my mom was allowed to ask questions. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, <is> that... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, no. You know, I, I think a lot of people would say, what's your dream? Your dream is to win the Tour de France or your dream is to win Paris-Roubaix or something like that. And honestly, um, I've already done that. I've done that, you know, making bikes for other people. You know, my bikes have already won the Tour de France. My bikes have already won Paris-Roubaix World Championships. And, you know, and of course with AG2R, we've already had some amazing results. But I think what is my dream? My dream is that, you know, factor is an ends to a means. Um, we we want to support some charities. We want to support uh, some young riders. We actually, we do support young riders. We do support charities. We do want to get more people riding bikes. We do want to help build the sport. And so, you know, my dream is that factor can continue to grow so that we can continue to do things like that you know, a lot of people know about Israel Startup Nation, but they don't know about, you know, Park Hotel Valkenburg, you know, the ladies teams that we sponsor. And they don't know about the development teams that we sponsor. You know, one of them is Israel Startup Nation, but another one is Team California, you know, as an under, under 21 team in America. And then we have uh, the Instagram, uh, uh, InstaFun team, uh, which is a ladies development team in Canada. So, you know, our goal, is, you know, we, we want to support some charities, which we do. And we want to help, you know, more young people and give them the opportunities to race and to, to enjoy the sport that we love. And so a successful factor, you know, is my dream so that I can continue to do that. That's great. That's uh, very philanthropic. Um, I guess we, the last question I have on, on here, um, could be from someone, you know, uh, Daki009. Hi, Rob. Taiwan <laughs> KOM. Oh, yeah, you know. Uh, hi, Rob. Taiwan KOM again this year? That's Jan Bakalan. So I'm sure you know oh. him as well. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. So John, who I introduced you guys to earlier, he and I were supposed to be racing Dirty Kanza today. So I only pin on a number once or twice a year. And so that was, yeah. you know, I'm kind of upset about not being able to do Dirty Kanza. So, and last year at the Taiwan KOM, we said never again, but perhaps now with COVID-19 and no other events, we might have to consider it. But not uh, John sticking his tongue out. He doesn't want to do it again. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, but really looking forward to experiencing the gravel events. So I think that looks like a lot of fun, so. Yeah, 
Yeah, it certainly made uh, made a big impression on the cycling scene. Thanks for the chat, Rob. It's been super, super yeah. insightful. Um, thanks for showing us around the around the offices as well and the factory. You're welcome. It's, uh, yeah, it's good to see you. And hopefully one day I'll make it across to Taiwan and have a look around myself. Absolutely. <laughs>